everyone. Good afternoon, my students and whoever is watching. Uh, today, I'm going to carry on with chapter 9, that is uh, 9.5, 9.6, and 9.7. So I'm going to finish chapter 9 by today, and hopefully by next week, I can start chapter 10. Okay, so I think your exams will be coming up uh, soon, I think next month. So I hope that you uh, get some benefit from this lesson and the lessons that I've had for the past uh, weeks, all right? Okay, let me start by sharing screen. Uh, I hope you can see this. Yeah, all right. So we're going to do 9.5 defecation, the process of uh, removing feces from the body. Okay, we have already seen 9.3, 9.4, which is absorption and assimilation last week. Okay, so let's carry on. Right, I hope uh, who's watching, uh, I don't see any comments. Maybe you will come in later and let me know uh, who is watching. All right. So let me see. No comments here so far. Okay, let's carry on. Uh, where are we? Okay, now defecation. Now sometimes you may be wondering, uh, why do we have, you know, I'm sure you've seen some books, uh, the spelling of D-E-F without an A there, D-E-F-E-C-A-T-I-O-N. Okay, both are pronounced defecation. Okay, the difference in the spelling is both are acceptable. Okay, for F-A-E with the A there, of feces or with an A there, it is, this is a British spelling. So I think it's more preferable uh, for us all right, in Malaysia to use British spelling. But if you were to spell it with D-E-F-E without the A, D-E-F-E-C-A-T-R-O-N, it is also acceptable actually because, but actually that is American spelling. Okay, so both are acceptable. Unless of course your English teacher, and you're writing this for English, all right, you have to check with her or him whether you're accept allowed to use uh, American spelling or not for English. Okay, let's carry on. Now, first, we need to know what is the uh, organ that carries out defecation. So, large intestine. So, here's a picture of the large intestine. And you notice that large intestine has got like three parts, okay? Three, uh, what do you call, uh, three sections of the large intestine, also known as colon, okay? And we write down here. So, large intestine is also known as C-O-L-O-N, Colon, uh, let me put it in. Okay, C O L O N. All right, I'm going to rub this because later on I'm going to put some uh, words there. So let me rub this off first. Okay, now let's name some parts. So this is called the appendix. In humans, this is used, uh, mainly useless, lah, right? It does not serve any function. So it's there, it's a res uh, residual of one part out of our, all these uh, colon. And then you have this, the first part, all right, it's called the cecum. The cecum uh, for human is quite small. It doesn't really carry much purpose uh, unless we are talking about herbivores, right, those animals that uh, feed on what you call grass and so on. You have a cecum that is enlarged so that you can have, uh, what you call, they can uh, break down the cellulose in the body, okay, in the, in the food. Okay, then you have this part of the colon which runs upwards, okay, going upwards. This is called the ascending colon. Ascending means moving up, okay. Then you have the other part here which is going like horizontal, the horizontal section here. This is called the transverse colon. And the other one, you can see it comes downwards. This is the descending colon, all right, descending, coming down. And then towards the end of the colon, or towards the end of the uh, large intestine, you have one place where we store the feces while waiting for it to be removed we have this uh, part which is called the rectum and at the end you have the uh, part which uh, produce which uh, channels the faces out of the body this is called the anus and there's muscles that the muscle is called the sphincter anal sphincter to control so that you do not have unnecessary accidents okay unwanted accidents means it's not ready for you to remove the feces, but it comes up by itself. Uh, that is because if you do not have, if you have a problem with the sphincter. Okay, what is the function of large intestine? Yeah, it serves two main functions. Okay, number one is it is for absorption of water and minerals. So by this time, when the uh, what do you call the the remaining part of the food after passing through the small intestine. What comes into the big intestine here is what is not needed, except for, of course, water, lah, right? So this is the small intestine. It comes into this part here. What you have here are uh, semi-solid, 
all right a lot of things which can be reused back this is water and minerals so they will absorb back water and minerals in the colon and of course there is once the water and minerals are absorbed back the substance there will become solid and that is your feces so feces formation okay what are the contents what are the things that enter the the first part of your ascending colon so what you have here is undigested food so usually uh these things that you cannot digest like you have accident accidentally uh swallowed some small seeds okay seed watermelon seeds and so on so these are undigested and you have dead cells uh the inner walls of the intestines it will shed cells cells die okay and it will be broken and it will be released or it will be moved from the inside layer of the intestine and it comes up to here you also have epithelial cells which is also from the intestine okay and also fiber the food that you eat of course you eat vegetables and also uh vegetables and also fruits there is cellulose from the plant cell wall so unfortunately we are not able to convert that cellulose into glucose even though it can be it, there is glucose okay because uh, cellulose is a form of carbohydrate so if you break it down you can actually get glucose and also simple sugar but we do not have the enzyme okay called cellulase to break down the cellulose so cellulose in our food will come out as cellulose itself we do not have the capacity to break down the uh, cellulose to get sugar or glucose so that's fiber all right and you get water there's a lot of water okay from that that, that goes into your cecum at this time so it's that semi-solid right it's still very watery at this time and then uh, all these things enter the ascending colon okay now inside there you will have this uh, peristaltic action that moves the contents along from the ascending colon to the transverse colon and subsequently to the ascending colon and the rectum the process that squeezes, you know, that process that moves it along is the contraction and relaxation of the muscles, okay? The smooth muscles on the colon, okay? And that is called peristalsis. So this is called peristaltic action, the rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the muscle, the smooth muscles. That helps to move it along. Okay, absorption of water and minerals. So you will see actually there's a lot of blood supply. Where does this water and mineral go, uh, get, go to? After it's absorbed, where does it go to? Actually, it's absorbed through the blood vessels. So you can see very clearly here, a lot of blood vessels are connected to the colon or the large intestine. So as the substance moves along the ascending colon, descending, uh, transverse colon and descending colon, the substances that is considered water and vitamins, they move into the blood vessels. So you can see the red and the blue, all these are blood vessels. And this substance absorbed into the blood vessels and is carried into the uh, back to the blood and uh, back to the heart to be circulated to be used. The substances absorbed are water and mineral salts. Okay, this is useful. So we try not to remove water and some metabolic byproducts of some bacteria. So the bacteria that is inside our large intestine, actually, some of them are beneficial bacteria. Bacteria which is good. Okay, because they produce substances like vitamin B, okay, which is good for our uh, nerves, okay, and vitamin K is uh, good for, it, it helps blood clotting and also folic acid, okay, it's a, a group of vitamin B. All right, so all these are absorbed together with the water into the blood vessels, okay, and then when it's being absorbed, you will find that the contents inside the uh, large intestine will become drier so as it become drier it will form the feces later right so the remaining waste in the colon is a semi-solid called feces so this is the british spelling with the a feces and this feces as it moves along it will become drier and drier as uh, this more and more water is reabsorbed back okay so this water is reabsorbed back into the blood so this feces inside the uh colon or the large intestine will become drier and more solid so feces also contains bile pigments okay the pigments as you see earlier the bile is was produced by the liver so it helps in emulsification so some of the bile okay will find its way here as well and then bacteria that comes off 
comes from the bacteria in the large intestine. Toxic substances that found its way into your food, okay? And also the walls of the large intestine will secrete mucus. Mucus is a substance which, line, which, which uh, help to uh, make it smoother, make the passage of the substance smoother. So this is mucus, all right? And it smoothens the movement of feces or facilitates uh, easier movement of the feces. There's mucus there as well. Okay, so now it moves down until it goes all the way to the rectum, okay? So formation of fe uh, feces. So the movement of feces will take about 12 to 24 hours before reaching the rectum. So almost uh, half the day to almost entire day, okay? From the beginning of the uh, large intestine, there's a uh, cecum right down to the rectum. It takes about half to one day, right? And then the feces will accumulate at the rectum. So the last part here is called the rectum, this part here. Okay, and then until it becomes so much, okay, there's pressure. Once it enters there, there's, it's going to apply pressure to the sides. So the pressure increases, and then as it becomes, the pressure becomes uh, higher and higher, you find you will get the urge to try to, to want to uh, go to the toilet to remove your this uh, contents of the bowel. It needs to go and uh, remove the feces. You have the urge, right? The urge. Otherwise, you don't feel the urge, you wouldn't be going to the toilet. Uh, just to want to remove it because you don't feel the urge, right? You only go to the toilet and you feel there's something pressing down onto the anus there. And these rectal muscles will contract, okay, to expel the feces and the anal sphincter, which is at the anus, will relax to allow the uh, feces to come out. So this process of removing the feces is called defecation. Okay, so don't say the word shit, nah. it's not a proper word. You have to use the word defecation, not to say shit, okay, which is not a, such a good word, all right? Okay, so that is the anal symptom. All right, now let's look at this. We have finished with 9.5. Now we go to 9.6. Balanced diet. What is the meaning of a balanced diet? Okay, so in order to uh, explain or to describe the meaning of balanced diet, you have, there are two important concepts here, there are two facts here that you have to write in your answer. Okay, first thing is, a balanced diet must be able to, uh, you, you, your diet must consist all the seven food classes. In order to be considered a balanced diet, you have to take all seven classes of food. Okay, if you do not want to mention all seven classes of food, then you want you have to mention all the classes in order to answer your question correctly. So you can say it's a diet that consists of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, vitamins, mineral salt, fiber, and water. That only is considered balanced, a balanced diet. And also the second point here is in the correct proportion. So a lot of students forget to say in correct proportion. They just mention, mention a balanced diet consists of seven or all the classes of food and full stop. So the second point here you must say in the correct proportion according to your needs. So if you're an athlete, you may need more carbohydrate than somebody who is uh, uh, staying put, uh, sitting down the whole day in the office doing office work. Okay, so it depends on what your needs are. Are you a very active person, or are you a person that sits around the whole entire day and you just need your, you know, you're doing your fingers to do computer work? Okay, it depends on what your needs are. So it must be able to, uh, uh what call fulfill your dietary needs your, in the correct proportion. So basically, we have a pyramid here, and you have seen the pyramid many, many times before in your lower secondary as well. So carbohydrates usually form the base. That means you need to pick carbohydrates the most. Okay, how many servings? You can look it up yourself. And the second level, okay, which is lesser, but you have vegetables and fruit because this uh, provide your fiber and also your vitamins and your minerals. Okay, so you have your carbohydrates, vitamins, mineral, and fiber. You have four groups already. Then don't forget your protein, which is supplied by dairy products, okay, like cheese, milk, and so on. And also fresh meat, okay, uh, fish, chicken, or beef, and so on. So that's number five. And then do not forget about water as well. Water is not in this, but it is uh, forms a part of your daily requirement. And what's up here is the fat, sugar, and of course the salt must reduce to a minimum. So what is at the top, you must take the least. What is at the bottom, you take the most. Okay, so basically this is like a guide. So, 
All right, now, so let's look at energy value. All right, now, what is energy value? You know that food gives you energy, okay? But how much of energy is produced from the food that you eat? So there is a way to find out. In fact, there is an experiment that you can do, okay, which can also come out as a question in your practical paper because this can be uh, completed within 40 minutes, your experiment, okay? So energy value is known as the energy, the amount of energy that is released when one gram of food is completely oxidized. Completely oxidized, that means it's burnt, okay? So the only way for you to carry out this experiment is you have to burn the food. When it burns the food, it produces heat and you transfer that heat to water, okay? You transfer it to something that you can measure the rise in the heat. So you use water usually, okay? Water is a very good uh, uh, absorber of heat, okay? And it's also a good, uh, what they call, it can uh, absorb a lot of heat without uh, increasing the temperature that much. Okay, so the unit of energy value is kilo joule per gram or joule per gram or even calorie. Usually for science, like biophysics and chemistry and so on, we will be using kilo joule per gram or joule per gram. In a calorie, we we'll probably maybe use it for food science, okay, like uh, domestic science, uh, uh, they call it science rumah and all that, maybe use calorie. But for science, for biology, we use usually kilojoule or joule per gram, okay, these are the units we can use to measure. And one calorie is uh, actually 4.2 joules, uh, okay, so, but we will use joules in our calculation. Okay, so uh, what is the kind of uh, concept we're using here? So when you burn the food, the food releases the heat. So you're going to transfer that heat to a body of water. And scientists have found out that you need 4.2 joules, or rather one calorie, uh, to be absorbed by one gram of water to raise the temperature to by one degree Celsius at room temperature, at room uh, atmospheric, at atmospheric pressure. So that means that is the amount of energy that you need, the water needs to absorb. 4.2 joules uh, by one gram of water and it will rise by to become one degree Celsius higher. So that amount of water in order to raise the temperature to, uh, to one degree Celsius by one gram of water, that amount of uh, energy is actually 4.2 joules. Okay, so we call it the specific energy value. So here, how do they measure this? So this is an actual, uh, what you call a bomb calorie meter, which will be uh, more accurate, okay? We don't have this in the lab, neither do we need it because we can do a simpler version of it in our experiment. So the bomb calorie meter is a device to find out when you oxidize this particular food, how much energy can it release, okay? So it's more accurate because it's a closed system, it close up. But when we do our experiment, we can't close it up, okay? It's open. The the heat can be released into the air. So here it minimizes loss of heat because it's a closed, in a closed container. Okay, so you don't need to memorize the parts here. You don't need to memorize the names, but you need to know how to carry out the experiment in the lab using a simplified version of a calorimeter. Okay, I'll show you afterwards. And the formula that you need to use is energy value you have to memorize this uh, because sometimes it's not given to you. It's even for objective question. They give you all the data, calculate the energy value. You have to memorize the formula. It's not difficult. 4.2 times mass of water. Now, you need to remember it's mass of water on the top. Not food. Uh. Food sample is at the bottom. Divide by food sample. Mass of water because you need the water. How much water will be absorbing your heat? So the mass of water, it will be in grams. Okay, if you use ml, ml is the same. One ml of water is basically one gram because of the density. Okay, density of uh, one ml will give you, uh, you know, one gram. That is the density of water. Lah. So if you're using one ml, that means it's one gram. If you're using 20 ml of water, it will be 20 grams. You don't have to weigh the water. You just measure the volume of water. And then rise in temperature. When you start off your food, you have to measure, when you start off burning, before you burn your food, you have to measure the water temperature. This is initial. Then after, when, when you burn it, the water will rise, the temperature will rise, and you wait for it 
wait for the temperature to rise until the highest, you read off the highest uh, reading. Okay, then you take that uh, difference, the final minus initial, that is your rise in temperature. Then you divide that with the mass of food sample. How much uh, food did you use to burn? Okay, one gram, there'll be one gram here. If it's uh, five grams, you divide by five. And there's a 1,000 here. Now, the reason why we have 1,000 here is because we are, if you're dividing by 1,000 here, your answer would be kilojoule per gram. That is your unit. Energy value is either joule per gram or kilojoule per gram. If you divide by 1,000, your answer will be kilojoule per gram. If you don't divide by 1,000, you still can get your answer, but make sure your uh, unit is joule per gram. Both are acceptable. Either kg per gram or joule per gram. Okay, both are fine. Okay, yeah, clear. Okay, let me carry on with the example. Okay, of a calculation later. Okay, so precautionary steps. So you, whenever you do experiments, sometimes they ask you for precautionary steps. What are the precautionary steps that you should observe when you carry out experiments? Okay, you will see here that they have clamped the thermometer. So you try not to have the bulb of the thermometer touch the base of the boiling tube. Okay, because it's not so accurate. When you when this when this uh bulb touches the base of the boiling tube, you're not actually measuring the uh temperature of the water. You're measuring the temperature of the boiling tube. All right, so you try to suspend it in the water. So Make sure the bulk of the thermometer does not touch the base of the boiling tube. This is one, uh, one precautionary step. Lah. So either you hold it or you clamp it, or if you have any other way, you try to uh, put something there that it, your thermometer does not touch the base. Okay. So, And also when you read the temperature, please do not take it out of the water. Right? If you take it out of the water, you are reading the temperature of the air. You are not reading the temperature of the water. Okay. Next. When during the experiment, when the when the fire is burning, when your food is burning, right, the heat will be trans transferred to the water. The water will absorb the heat. So make sure you stir the water gently to ensure uniform distribution of heat. So the heat rises, the water becomes uh, uniformly heated up, not just the base, the bottom becomes hot. Okay, so you uh, stir it gently. Okay. Next, uh, you do not want the energy that is produced by the burning food to be dissipated to be lost to the surrounding you try to contain all that energy and transfer it to the uh, water so in order to reduce loss of heat you try to uh, put something to block it okay we use a windshield uh, so that the flame of the burning food does not extinguish prematurely that means too fast your food has not finished burning. There is still energy inside your food there. And then the fire goes off. Okay, you don't want that to happen. You want to make sure the food is oxidized or combusted or burned entirely, completely. So that's why you do not want your wind to extinguish your fire. Okay, try to keep the flame burning as long as possible. Okay, so that is the principle there. All right, try not to have wind blowing and then you still have when the fire goes off, there is still energy stored inside, which is not released. You don't want that. Okay, next. So you also want to make sure that the heat is trans uh, is absorbed by the water. So you try to transfer the burning food immediately. So don't keep it burning in the Bunsen burner. You are for, Of course, you put it into the Bunsen burner to ignite your food. But once it starts burning, do not keep it in the Bunsen burner and you forget about it to take it out. Once it starts burning, you have to put it immediately under the base, at the base of the boiling tube to make sure this energy that is released by the burning food is absorbed by the water, okay, as much as possible. So don't waste the energy into the atmosphere. Try to pass that energy to the water and then you measure it later, okay, using the formula. Okay, and also obtain the highest reading of the thermometer. Do not... Uh, do not just read up what you want to read. Make sure sometimes your temperature will keep on rising. Okay, I've had it once before when we did the experiment. The what the the, the kachang that we burn, uh, the cashew, I can't remember cashew nut or the peanut. The, the the burning was so efficient, was so good that even the water started to boil. 
That means the temperature will, will reach up to 100, on, like 100 degrees Celsius. It was that efficient, that water. That means the water, the, the, the heat that was released, uh, it was the, so much until the temperature could even rise 100. Okay, so you make sure that you transfer all the energy to the water. Okay, and obtain the highest. Don't obtain some, somewhere and then it goes up and then you take the temperature when it's still going up. Make sure you read the highest reading. Okay, so that's a precautionary step. Let's go on to calculation. So how do you calculate? Let me give you an example. Lah, all right, this question one. Okay, so take all the data from there that's given to you and put into the formula. Okay, so let's take the formula. That's why you have to remember. This is all they give you. They don't give you the formula. So 4.2 times mass of water times rise in temperature. Assuming the mass of water is in gram, rise in temperature is in degree Celsius, mass of food sample is in gram. So you can put everything into the formula. Okay, so 4.2, I don't know whether anyone is there. Okay, nobody's there. All right, so I can't call anyone to answer. Why don't you take out a calculator and start punching your calculator? Okay, so 4.2 times mass of water is, be sure to take 20, not 0 0.8, eh? 0 0.8 is your food, mass of water. Then times your uh, difference, that is the rise in temperature. You take your final minus the initial. So here it is 27. You don't need to put the degree Celsius here. No, it doesn't matter. You just work with the numbers. And then you divide by the mass of food sample, which is 0 0.8. And don't forget your 1,000 there. If you put 1,000 there, that means it is kilojoule per gram, your answer. If you don't put your 1,000 there, it will be joule per gram. Okay, so punch in and make sure when you punch your calculator, you do it this way. Okay, if you're not using your electronic, sorry, you're not using your uh, scientific calculator, you can use a normal calculator, but you've got to punch it this way. 4.2 times 20 times 27 divide 0 0.8 divide 1000. Not times 1000. You do not press times yet because here is divide by 1000. So you want to do it all in one step. Use a calculator, a normal calculator will do. You do not need a scientific one. 4.2, you punch in, times 20, times 27, divide 0 0.8, divide 1,000. Not times. If you times it, your answer will be wrong. Okay, your answer will be 2.835 kilojoule per gram. Okay, or if you're not sure, you can bracket this one. Uh, then you can times up. If you want to bracket it out first, you work on the 0 0.8 times. 1,000, that means 800. Okay, your 4.2 times 20 times 27 divided by 800. Okay, if not, then you punch in one step. Make sure you divide 1,000. Then you get 2.835. The answer is B for boy. Okay, all right, clear? So you have to remember the formula. Can't help you with that. You have to remember it. Okay, now let's look at another calculation. Ah, Muhammad 4987. Okay, welcome. Okay. Uh, it's my purpose to give you some information that you can help you, okay? So, next, let's look at determining the concentration of vitamin C. Okay, how to determine the concentration of vitamin C? So, we need to uh, react your vitamin C with a chemical, with a substance, okay? To indicate uh, whether how much of vitamin C is needed to react to this uh, substance. Uh. So the substance that we're using is dichlorophenol endorphinol. It's quite a mouthful. Dichlorophenol. You see, I highlighted the D and the C and the P and the I and the P. So the short name for this is DCPIP. Okay, over here. See that? You can just use DCPIP in your answer, answering or whatever. You don't need to write your food. Okay, so this DCPIP, once it uh, comes into contact with your vitamin C or ascorbic acid, Another name for vitamin C is ascorbic acid. It will become colorless. Okay, it will become colorless. So what you need to do is your experiment, this one can also come up in your paper three because it has been, uh, it, it can be done in 40 minutes. Okay, you have to put your DCPIP into a bottle. All right, and then you add in the sample. That means your vitamin C and see how much is needed to decolorize your DCPIP. You must add it slowly. Okay, you use a syringe and you make sure your syringe does not, you don't drop it from the top. You make sure your needle goes to the base. 
Okay, now, what happens when your uh, solution is, let's say, your orange is orange color? Your DCPIP already become colorless. But because your orange is orangey, you will also get orange color. So do not wait until we get colorless. Uh, you're not going to get colorless if your lime juice is yellow. You will get the yellow color for the lime juice. But if you are using ascorbic acid, which is colorless, uh, then you will find your result here will be colorless. Okay? If it doesn't have any vitamin C, when you drip it inside, it's not going to have any reaction. So you'll find that it doesn't be colorized. Uh. Okay, let's look at uh, the reaction that happens in your this experiment is your vitamin C will be oxidized by DCPIP. And your DCPIP will be reduced by vitamin C. Okay, now you will learn more of this in your form 5, I think, when you learn about redox. I'm not sure whether redox form 5 or form 4 uh, chemistry, but this is a redox reaction, a reduction and an oxidation that happens at the same time, okay, between two substances. All right, okay, yeah? So let's go on to looking at how the experiment is done. So here, you have to do the experiment twice. Okay, one time, the first time is you have to put in a solution that you know the concentration of your ascorbic acid you have to prepare okay or rather the lab assistant will prepare for you maybe 0.1 percent of ascorbic acid solution you do this one first so you drop in your ascorbic acid make sure the needle is in the dcpip don't drip from the top because if it is in contact with the air your ascorbic acid will be oxidized so that means your vitamin c content will be less. So don't let your ascorbic acid touch the air. Try to put the entire needle into your DCPIP and slowly push your piston so that a little bit goes in and stir gently to make sure it is evenly distributed and make sure the color uh, change is stable. Okay? If it's still changing color, don't add in some more. Make sure you stir, put in a little bit, stir it and make sure the color becomes constant. No more changes. Ah, then you can add some more. Okay, so we have to be very careful. You cannot be pressing everything together. You would have missed the point. You would have missed the neutral, I mean, we call the uh, end point. Okay, so now after you do this, you get how much is remaining in your specimen tube. That means, okay, let's say, for example, you have already added in, uh, you have already added in your ascorbic acid, and now over here, you originally, you put 5 ml. Now your remaining is 3 ml inside your piston, uh, inside your syringe. That means how much have gone in? If you fill in your syringe 5 ml, you have uh, put your ascorbic acid into the solution and now you are left, this is the remaining. The remaining is 3 ml. That means how much have gone in? Okay, I don't know whether anyone wants to answer me. Ah, you end with, okay. Muhammad, I wouldn't know because your school, this is uh, from 4, right? From 4, your school will set the paper, all right? Set the paper. So it's up to your school to uh, set. It's not a satara. It's not a standardized paper. So it's very hard for me to give you any tips. You have to ask your teacher for your tips. Yeah, if your teacher wants to give you tips, uh, okay? Because I'm not your teacher. I don't teach your school. Uh, if uh, I would be able to teach, I can tell you because I'm second grader, all right? Okay, now, so, yes, correct, Muhammad, uh, 2 ml, correct. Now, you need to determine how much has gone inside. So, remember, don't take the 3 ml. You have to take 5 ml minus 3 ml, and what you need is this one. Okay, then you do another time. Take another tube, specimen tube, add in fresh supply of uh, DCPIP, usually 1 ml. Lah. You put 1 ml of DCPIP, and then you now, you want to test your sample. The sample may be your juice, your orange juice. Or your lime juice or your guava juice okay now you're ready to test your sample you do the same thing you add in slowly and stir it make sure that the color change is uh already no more no more changing then you will find it's still blue you find it still become purple all right that means it's not become colorless yet you add in slowly slowly until it becomes the sample color for ascorbic acid, it will be colorless because your ascorbic acid is colorless. But your sample juice, depending, if you are using orange juice, then you must uh, put in enough 
so that it becomes the same color as your sample juice. You do not need, you, you cannot wait until it becomes colorless. It will not be colorless because your sample juice is already uh, orange. So you have to uh, add in until it becomes the same color as your sample juice. That is actually your DCPI is already decolorized. Okay, so if you're using lime juice, you must make sure it becomes yellow, uh, uh, depending on the color of your juice. Uh. Okay, so let's say now this is 5 ml. Beginning, you put in 5 ml. And now you are left with, let's say, uh, you are left with here 4 ml. Okay, if you're left with 4 ml, that means 1 ml of your juice has gone in. All right, so just now was 2 ml. Now it's 1 ml. Now you're ready to calculate putting in your formula. Okay, I'll introduce the formula to you afterwards. Now, precautionary step first. First of all, you must stir in gently. Yeah? So you don't shake it. Don't shake the tube. Because when you shake the tube, you are introducing more oxygen into your DCPIP. If your DCPIP has been reduced, you're adding more oxygen, it will be oxidized again. That means you need to add in more vitamin C. You need to add in more sample. It's not accurate anymore. Okay, so please use the word gently. You have to say stir gently. Stir the DCPIP gently with the needle. Don't shake it. Okay, so make sure the ascorbic acid or the sample juice has reacted completely. Either don't uh, add in or at one go when there is, you may have, you may have over added. You may have passed the end point. So slowly, bit by bit, stir it. Okay, this requires a bit of skill actually. Yeah? So you, you only get acquire the skill by carrying experiment experiment i'm sure your teacher will let you do it okay so you add in slowly stir it until you find no more changes okay and then it's still still blue that means your dcpip is still not colorless are uh, not colorless yet add in some more slowly okay let's go on to the next part huh? now determining the concentration you need a formula okay so i will not go through the theory of how to get the formula you just use the formula to answer because it'd be too complicated okay i don't need to waste the time for that so let's say just now the result we get is this when you use uh, uh your dcprp i'm uh, sorry when you use ascorbic acid you got your x solution uh, xml so you needed xml to decolorize your dcprp and for your sample juice you needed let's say yml okay you need to just now 2 ml right 2 ml was your x and then this one was 1 ml was your y so all you need to know is how much has gone inside you need how much to decolorize your dcprp all right okay so now let's look at the formula there are two ways of doing it depending on your question do they want in percentage if the question asks you uh what is the percentage of vitamin c then you use this formula Percentage of vitamin C is equivalent to, I give you a simple way of remembering it, 0.1x divided by y. Ah, what is your x? Your x is this, okay? What is your y? Your y is the volume of sample juice needed. Then what is your 0.1? Y got 0.1. Now, 0.1 depending on this. This is called the concentration of the ascorbic acid. So if your ascorbic acid is 0 0.1, you have your 0 0.1 here. Usually it'd be 0 0.1. If your ascorbic acid is a different percentage, you have to use that different percentage, maybe 0 0.2. Okay, it's not always 0 0.1. So depending on the concentration of the ascorbic acid that's given to you. So it will be stated. It will be stated in the question if you were to uh, calculate this. Okay, or if the question wants you to put uh unquote in uh, concentration means not percentage milligram per ml okay if it's milligram per ml okay or milligram per centimeter cube is the same you put 1.0 x over l uh, x over y okay no need to times 0 0.1 you just x over y you will get the answer okay let's do a question okay to see how to use this formula okay percentage of vitamin c let me give you a question here 0.1 percent ascorbic acid is needed uh, is used and then first of all uh, you use 1.3 ml to decolorize your 1 ml of dcpip then after that you repeated the experiment using orange juice and you found that you needed 1.5 ml okay so how do you use this formula now so remember the formula we find the percentage first it's always easier to find the percentage first because your ascorbic acid is given in percentage form Okay, so the formula here, if you can recall, 
percentage of vitamin C is equal to 0.1x over y because your 0.1 is this, so you use this one. Okay, x over y. And don't forget your x is what? Huh? X is your ascorbic acid uh, volume that is needed and your y is your this one. So you add, put in your 0.1 over here, you put in your 1.3 as your x and you put in your 1.5 as your y. So okay, fish out a calculator. All right. Okay, too late for you lah. Okay, I just cut in time ah. So 0 0.1 times x 1.3 yeah, and then divide by 1.5, your answer is 0.09%. Okay, just leave it in percentage form. Now, if your question asks you to quote in mg per ml, so look at the question carefully, mg per ml or mg uh, milligram per uh, centimeter cube, okay? Then you can convert this. You can use this formula first. Your answer is 0.09%, right? Then you can convert it this way. You use your 0.09. Shortcut, ah, shortcut. You just times 10. You times 10. Then your answer will be 0 0.9 and then it will be mg per ml or mg per centimeter cube. Uh, that's why this formula is very important. You find it in percentage form. If you want it in mg per ml, you just times 10. You would have gotten the answer. Just times 10. Okay, simple. Just Always remember this one in percentage first. Okay, now let's go on to the next part. Now, there's a concept called Pinggan Sehat Malaysia, okay, which is uh, uh, proposed by KKM, uh, uh, Kementerian Kesehatan Malaysia. So, this Pinggan Sehat Malaysia, what is the uh, recommendation for a Pinggan Sehat? Okay, so last time people say, uh, you eat a lot of rice, uh, very good. Uh, okay? Nowadays, we don't go for rice already. We go for other, we go for fruits and vegetables. That should make up the, and most of your food, not the carbohydrate, not the protein. Okay, so a balanced diet for each individual will vary, will change according to your lifestyle. Like I mentioned just now, are you very active? If you're very active, you have to eat more carbohydrate. Okay, or are you fighting any disease in your body? Uh, maybe you are... Uh, a cancer patient, okay, uh, touch wood, all right? Maybe somebody is cancer patient. Then you need to build, eat more protein because you need to build new cells. You need to make a hormone, you need to make uh, these antibodies. You may need more protein, okay? So your specific requirements, okay? But generally, we have this Pinga Siak Malaysia, which is quarter, quarter, half, or suku, suku, separo. What is the suku and what is the separo? The suku is your cereal and grains, your biji, biji rain. Right, that constitute carbohydrate should be a quarter. You look at your plate, nah, right? A quarter of your plate should be filled with rice, not the entire uh, plate. Then a quarter of your plate should be filled with uh, protein-based food, meat and dairy, fish, uh, uh, meat and so on. And half of it, uh, half of it uh, should be made up of fruits or vegetables. Then it's considered sehat. Your pinggan is sehat. Not only pinggan sehat, you are sehat. Okay? So that is what it means by your uh, half half quarter the half is not carbohydrate the half is your fruit and vegetables okay let's look at uh, obesity ah, this is a, com a, a very quite a big problem in malaysia the percentage of people who are obese is actually quite high so uh, of course not the highest in the world uh. but how do you classify obesity obesity is if you call someone obese uh, you have to have a certain quali uh, qualification not to say fat means obese uh, obesity is, classi uh, is classified as abnormal or excessive fat accumulation in the body. But how abnormal is it? The BMI must be higher than 30. If you measure somebody's BMI, I'm sure you know the body mass index, okay? If you measure it and it's less than 30, you don't call it obese. You don't call the person obese. You maybe call it overweight. From 25, okay, BMI of 25 to 29.9, it's called overweight only not obese obese is 30 and above okay and then when you're lower than 25 or oh, you are normal 25 a certain range huh? and then if you're lower than certain then you consider abnormal too thin too, too thin already too skinny okay what is the cause of obesity okay of course the type of food that you eat lah. excessive or imbalanced food intake especially food that is rich in sugar carbohydrates okay rice sugar and also fats junk food a lot of sugar unhealthy drinks a lot of sugar okay and your lifestyle rest at home you sit down and watching computer the whole day or watch your tv you don't do much exercise so
so in proper use of stored energy. The stored energy is the food that you eat. You don't burn it. You don't burn it, it accumulates inside your body. Okay, effect. Okay, why is obesity not good? Okay, why? It's not, not only because it doesn't look so nice. Okay, it is actually it's life threatening. It can cause you to have uh, multiple other conditions where it, it can threaten your life because other diseases will come. Example, you have health problems like diabetes mellitus, which is uh, penyakit kencing manis, which is called, uh, you know, urine, okay, high glucose level. Cardiovascular diseases, atherosclerosis, accumulation of plaque in your arteries, where you have a lot of cholesterol all stuck inside there, the lumen, so it increases or it decreases the flow and increases the pressure of the blood, okay, which is bad for your heart. And you get hypertension, okay, the uh, pressure is high, your blood pressure becomes high. All right, okay. Oh, Kenneth, hi, hi. Uh, thanks for joining. You can watch the rewatch uh, the, the what later. All right. Okay, so, and then it may result in uh, life threatening uh, conditions like you may have a heart attack. Okay, so by the way, a heart attack, if it's a medical term, doctors will use this word myocardial infarction. MI for short. MI. Not missing in action, uh, not MIA. Uh. MI is missing in action. So myocardial infarction is your. You know, a very posh word for heart attack, actually. They will use it on the hospital. Doctors will say that, okay? If you are saying I'm I and you know what it is, wow, people are impressed, okay? You have this medical knowledge, okay? You have stroke, right? Stroke is when your blood capillary vessels, they break in the brain. So you have a blood clot. When the blood leaks out, you have a clotting there. So that is, we call it angin uh, ahma, we call it BMR, we call it stroke. Right? In Cantonese, we call it zhong feng. So... Uh, it, will, it will affect your body. If it is clots in your brain, it affects your mobility, it affects your functioning of your body. So maybe you're not able to speak, you can't walk and so on. That is a stroke, okay? It's because of hypertension that your blood vessels will break. Okay, that's obesity. Now, what about special dietary needs? In case there are questions that came up, question comes up. Huh? So what about children? What are the dietary needs for growing children? Okay, as you know, they are very active. They need a lot of energy, but more importantly, they are still growing. They need to make uh, new cells. So they have to have a lot of protein. Uh, so you got to give them high protein. Okay, and you must also rationalize it. Why high protein? So you want to answer? Hi, Amber. Hi. Okay, hi. So so if you have high protein, it will help to build new cells. Okay, so you have to, if when you want to answer, you have to rationalize why high protein. Maybe we'll give you one mark here, but you cannot explain you probably some of the schemes are very, very particular. You have to explain it before you get your marks. Okay, just like your function, your, your feature and adaptation, your, your explanation, F and E. So what about protein, uh, carbohydrate? They are very active, so they need a lot of energy. Okay, they, uh, carbohydrate is to supply energy. Okay, what about pregnant women? Okay, pregnant women, they also have special dietary needs. They have to have, eat a lot of uh, protein. Because they are building new cells. They are forming another baby inside the body. It has to have material to make cells. So to build new cells. Okay. And also high fiber to prevent constipation. Okay. So if pregnant women, they may get constipation if they do not eat enough fiber. Okay. And also high iron. Now don't forget, you need to make more blood because the baby needs blood also. So in order to make blood, you need to make hemoglobin. And how to make hemoglobin? You need the iron. Iron is forms part of the molecule of hemoglobin. So it has to, you need to supply enough iron for the mother. Okay, then what about cancer patient? I mentioned just now. Cancer patient, right? So someone who is fighting cancer, someone who is undergoing chemotherapy or radiotherapy, a lot of cells will die off. Okay, so you need to make new cells, high protein, repair tissues, build antibodies to increase your immune system. Okay, high protein. And also high vitamins and minerals. This is for healthy functioning of the processes in your body. So to ensure that your body is healthy. Okay? Alright, clear. And also low, uh, low one. Uh, this is something low one. Uh, everything is high, uh, except low. Low preservatives. Try not to eat, take, uh, take artificial coloring. These are uh, some also artificial preservatives. Uh, some of them have been known to be carcinogenic. That means they can even cause cancer that makes it even worse you are fighting cancer and you do not need to increase things that can make you even uh, your cells will mutate and become more cancerous okay and additives things that are 
put into the food to enhance the flavor, make it sweeter, make it taste nicer, all the artificial flavoring, stay off that, okay? because they are known to be carcinogenic, some of them. Okay? Go for organic food, go for basic uh, taste only, just salt and all that, savory. Don't need to add, don't need to think of eating very nice food now, okay? You are fighting a very, a very, you know, a very lethal kind of disease. Think of your health. Okay, let me go on to uh, health issues related to digestive system and eating habits. So some of people have very bad eating habits. They're not healthy, okay? Because of the, maybe their stress, their lifestyle and so on. So they're not eating well. Because they're not eating well, they have uh, problems like this, huh? right? So some of them, uh, they have obesity problems, okay? Obesity problems, they, of course, you try, you can diet, ask them to diet and so on. If everything else fails, there's one quite extreme kind of a, a process uh, of a surgery that you can do. You need to eat more carbo. Huh? Mm, I've not heard cancer patients eat more carbo. Maybe the energy. La. Energy, okay, it's possible also, but protein is important, building new cells. Carbo is probably you need energy. Energy is also needed for cell division. Don't forget, okay, you need cell division. You need to make new cells. That requires... Cell re reproduction requires energy also. So not to say more carbo, but more protein is important. Lah. Okay? Uh, too much carbo will also may also give you obesity or um, give you uh, uh, excessive weight gain, which is not so good. Lah. Okay? But uh, most importantly, is protein. If you talk about you want to rationalize carbohydrate, yes, yes, you need that for making new cells. You need energy as well. Okay, so this I'm talking about, I'll go back to this one. Huh? This is called reducing the size of your stomach. Okay, this is called gastric bypass. You take one portion of the top part of your stomach here. This one. Okay, here. Yeah. And you join it to the jejunum, uh, jejunum. That means you shorten the pathway. So your this stomach now, you've got a gastric pouch, will hold little food. It doesn't hold that much food. So you it, it, does, if, it force you not to eat so much because your stomach cannot cannot support, cannot uh, accumulate, uh, cannot even store that much food. So this process is called, this procedure is called a gastric bypass. Or we know it as another name, it's called bariatric surgery. Okay, so this is known to uh, reduce appetite. Ah, so people who cannot stay off food, but try dieting, but try everything, and everything fails. Ah, this is the last resort you can do now. But of course, it's invasive. Lah. You have to open up your stomach and open up your abdomen, you know. So try not to go to this extreme, lah, all right? If you can, try to work with other methods first. Don't go this. This is the last, last, uh, last we call resort. Because there is a side effect. There are side effects related to this bariatric surgery. So it involves a reduction of the stomach size using various methods of surgery. is to control your appetite. So you eat less, Okay. So this is what happens. You slice one part of your, you, you reduce the size of the stomach. So you get a new stomach there and the other part is removed. Okay. So let's look at side effects of bariatric surgery. So I said, don't go for this unless you have no other choice. Okay. You will have something called GERD. Yeah, GERD is a gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay, this is a normal stomach. Lah. Okay, I can't find a stomach that is a bariatric surgery one, ah, half one. Ah. So what happens is your stomach content can go up. Okay, you can see it can go up to the esophagus and you will have, because the finger is open, so it's not so elastic. Then your acid, including your hydrochloric acid, it goes up your esophagus and it burns. You find uh, something like your acid coming up ah, and your esophagus don't have the protective lining, you know. You don't have the mucus that. So it burns your esophagus. Okay, so this is called acid reflux. Okay, your acid goes up. And then you may also experience nausea and vomiting. These are the side effects of this procedure. Okay, expanded esophagus. Your esophagus becomes expanded. Your food prohibition, there are certain food you cannot eat. The risk of infection because it's open surgery. Lah. You have to open up your stomach to do the surgery. Okay, dizziness. Sometimes you may have low blood sugar level. You don't eat enough. There's not enough blood sugar, then you feel dizzy, not enough sugar in your blood. Then you have malnutrition because it's so little, right? You may even have some ulcer because of the lining there. Lining is not protected with mucus. You have defecation problems. So that's why I say try not to go through this unless you have no choice. Okay, then 
functions of fiber. This one you should know, lah. Right. So fibers stimulus peristalsis. That's why it's very important. You want your contents of the colon or the intestine to move as much as possible so that it does not stay there. Once it stays there, you got more water being reabsorbed and your the 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 feces will become hard. Once it becomes hard, when you push it out, when you push it out, you may cause what you call hemorrhoids. You push it up too much, it will hurt your anus there, right? And then you have your uh, veins there will be uh, will be inflamed. Then it becomes you injure it. Then you get all these uh, hemorrhoids. Absorbs and expels toxic substances. Okay, it also absorbs water, so it makes your feces soft. Uh, regulates the absorption of glucose, especially for patients who have uh, this diabetes and litus. Okay, that increase the population of beneficial bacteria. Okay, so you need some good bacteria inside your colon, and that is if you take more fiber, your bacteria will be better. That your beneficial bacteria will be more. Okay, so next one, uh, health issues related to defecation. If you have defecation problems, you will have these things. So, a uh, diet that is high in fiber will be very good fruits and vegetables, and also you drink enough water, sufficient water will facilitate bowel movements. That means make it move faster. It will not stay there for a long time. Okay, as it's staying there a long time, makes it hard. The feces will become hard. So, preventing, okay, health problems. If you don't have enough water, you don't have high fiber diet, you will have constipation. Constipation means uh, you don't go to the toilet often to, to push out your, this to remove your feces. Maybe once a week, that is considered constipated. Okay, once uh, a week is not very good. Is it permanent? Yeah, it's going to be permanent, Muhammad. Yes. A uh, side effect of that surgery, you mean? A uh, side effect of the surgery, if you take medication for your acid reflux, then you may reduce. Uh, okay. Uh, is it permanent? You mean the surgery? Yes, of course. Once you cut off that, you reduce the size, it will be permanent now. Uh. But you have to manage it. That means it's very easy for you to get the acid reflux. Because the size of the stomach is smaller, it's easier for the content to go up. So you may have more recurring acid reflux compared to other people. So you have to deal with it. Okay? Deal with all the side effects. Okay? Constipation is when you don't have, uh, not regular, okay? your bowel movement. Colon cancer, you'll find something, some growth there. The cells have become abnormal and you have some growth inside that is colon cancer. Okay, not good. Rectal cancer, you have rectal uh, cancer of these abnormal cells growing at the rectum there. And you have hemorrhoids. Uh, this happens when your veins have become inflamed because of all the pushing and pushing and pushing. Sometimes you have this piece of tissue jetting out there. And once your feces are too hard, you will rub against it. Then you have bleeding. Uh, that is your hemorrhoid. We call it ji chong in Cantonese, right? Ji chong. Or uh, in the end, we call it buwasi. Okay, so now. Health issues related to eating habits. Okay, so poor eating habits will cause these kind of problems. You can go faster. Huh? I'll finish in one hour. Gastritis. Uh, this is called your gastric problem. We call it. Uh, where you can't feel the burning sensation in your stomach. Muscle dysmorphia. Uh, some people will have this, uh, act, uh, we call it, not a normal concept about the body. They think the body is too small. So they compensate by doing a lot of exercise and bodybuilding because they want to look big. Okay, anorexia nervosa, I'm sure you're very familiar with this. Huh? Girls especially, they are very, very concerned with their body weight. They don't want to be fat because they say fat is not pretty, slim is pretty, so they go overboard. They diet too much. They try not to eat. And bulimia, this one got eat, but they will throw up after that. Okay, they will pretend to eat. They will show people they're eating, but after that, they have an, an, uh, an incessant need to try to remove what they've eaten. So they will poke their you know, throat and try to remove their food. Okay, let's go one by one. Huh? Gastritis is inflammation and corrosion of the stomach epithelial lining a layer by gastric juice because your gastric juice is acidic and so on. So it will corrode the inside because you don't have food to, to break down. So it's corroding the inside layer. Okay? Right, next one. Now, gastritis symptom, loss of appetite. You don't feel like eating because pain, uh, your stomach pain, uh, your, your stomach is having pain. Swollen belly, nausea, vomiting, heartburn. Heartburn is just like I said, the acid, uh, the acid moves out the esophagus. You feel the burning sensation there. Abdominal pain and indigestion. When you have eaten it, you find that your food cannot be digested. So it's called indigestion. So you feel a bloatedness there. 
So untreated gastritis can result in gastric ulcer. Huh? So ulcer is like you have a growth, uh, this, uh, the, the lining of the stomach, you have this ulcer. Also, it's like a less, uh, it's like a, a, a injury that injury to the lining that, okay? You have to treat it already. You have to see a gastro, uh, a, a, a gastro uh, specialist. Huh? Caused by what? Okay, what causes gastritis? So, causes by unhealthy food, spicy, fried, acidic food, irregular eating also. You're not eating at regular hours. Maybe you're too busy, but try to find time to eat. Huh? Otherwise, you may get gastritis. Excessive intake of alcohol. Alcohol can also cause gastritis and also painkillers because they eat on and they drink on empty stomach. Okay, your alcohol you drink it on empty stomach, then it will cause gastritis. And then also there is an infection, bacterial infection. The kind of bacteria is called Helicobacter pylori. This is known to cause gastritis. So that means bacteria has found its way into the stomach there, and it's growing there. This is an infection. The bacterial name is called Helicobacter pylori. Okay. And of course, stress, uh, okay? Sometimes now, say healthy, uh, no, uh, busy people, no time to eat, uh, uh, stress, uh, sometimes the workload and all that will also give you gastritis. Okay, next, uh, I'm going faster now. Bulimia, uh, bulimia is the, the urge to try to, you eat, you eat, you compulsive eating, you eat a lot, sometimes you eat a lot, it's called binge eating. It's an eating disorder characterized by binge eating. It means you, you purposely eat for the sake of eating, not because you're hungry, because you just want to eat, and you eat a lot. After you eat, you purge. Purge means you purposely remove your food. Maybe you take laxative. Lah. Laxative will make you relax your bowels. So you go, the food goes up the bottom way. But it can come up the top way up here. You put the, you know, the throat here. You make yourself, uh, the person makes herself vomit. Okay, self-induced vomiting. It's called purging. Lah. So take a lot and then vomit out the food. Either doing, uh, you know, poking the throat or you take laxative that will relax the uh, you know the the muscles in your large intestine, so that you have more bowel, uh, more uh, feces to remove. Okay, quite often. So when you have do this too often, you may have suffer from rehydration, dehydration because you vomit so much water out. Okay, nutritional problems. You don't your 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 nutrients are being uh, removed. You don't have enough for yourself. Cardiovascular disease or even kidney failure. Okay, so this is repeated after eating. Then vomit. After vomit, go eat again. Okay. Now anorexia nervosa. This one is, uh, this one they want to look pretty. Uh. It's also eating disorder characterized by low weight. Person very thin, very light. Fear of gaining weight. Scared what they eat. Uh, become uh will, will, will accumulate as fat. And then they feel very guilty after eating very guilty. Uh, okay. Desire to be thin because they been brainwashed by the uh model modeling world. Is it? Slim, all the models are so slim, so they want to be more slim means pretty, so they want to be thin, okay? Food restriction, because they don't eat certain food, okay? So, common among teenage girls who are obsessed with their body weight, okay? They have to check their weight every day, must stand on the weighing machine, make sure, ah, uh, 100 gram extra, so cannot, must go and do something, okay? Suffer from, it's actually a psychological problem, so it needs counselling. It maybe even need a uh, medical intervention. I uh, have to see a doctor and so on, psychiatrist and so on. So you can see this very extreme. All right, it's actually a person who looks like your skin and bones only. And this one is this is a man, uh, not a woman. Uh. And you can see that uh even men can can suffer from anorexia nervosa. Of course, less uh, less cases are uh, usually women. Uh. Women are more concerned. Too much of gastric ulcer can lead to stomach cancer. Uh, I think it's different. Gastric ulcer is not necessarily stomach cancer. Uh, stomach cancer is the cells have become abnormal. So stomach ulcer is a different thing from the uh, stomach cancer. I've not heard that it will lead to stomach cancer. Lah, because ulcer can be treated. Okay, next, uh, we go to the second last. Muscle dysmorphia. Uh, dysmorphia means the shape of the muscle has gone off already. It has no longer, no longer the normal one. Because these people... It's a mental health condition, ah, okay. It's also brainwashed, ah. They think that they look at self in the mirror. They don't like their body because they think their body is so small. Even though the person can be as large as this, the person is very muscular. The person look normal, okay. Very nice body shape. They always look at themselves and say, "I'm so thin, I'm so thin." So what they do is, they excessively want to train up their body. They do weightlifting training and they do exercise, especially for people who think that they're very small size. It looks like very unnatural 
because they are so sharp and then the board the, the muscles are bulging out everywhere okay so this is called muscle dysmorphia all right okay now this is excessive training and then you have all this body this is of course i'm not saying all weightlifters are having muscle dysmorphia this muscle dysmorphia is more of a mental thing okay they think that whatever they do is not enough they will keep on going more and making the body as big as possible okay that is a mental issue that has to be treated with uh, proper medical maybe uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist will have to counsel them okay they may even consume steroids to build their muscle okay or muscle building supplements to make the muscles go faster and bigger so usually these are guys uh, because the guys you know they want to look macho they want to look big and all that okay lastly uh, this is a bonus pika i'm sure many of you have not heard pika before okay pika all right pika is not common but it happens also sometimes you will see some people eating things that are not supposed to be food that eating disorder characters by eating non-food items okay it will not immediately make you die but then it's not supposed to be food lah. i don't know why they eat also ah. sometimes it's a psychological problem also lah, okay so commonly seen in childhood you see a lot of childhood they put things in your mouth and all that lah, all right they might even sample things that are not supposed to eat but sometimes it can occur in adulthood our adult people i mean people who are adult they know this one's not not food but they still want to eat it <laughs> okay so it can cause stomach upset of course it cannot be digested then you get stomach upset it may even cause your teeth injury because the thing is too hard okay i can tell what the things i eat now they eat stones you know eat pebbles or not eat glass you know oh my god okay malnutrition because what you're eating doesn't have any nutritional value that's why you get malnutrition now all right so what are the things they eat Plastic, oh my gosh, copper, cloth, paint, soap, okay, and cigarette butt. This is what has been, uh, you know, happened before, but I see it's not common. Okay, let's see the boy that eating paper, paper, uh, paper is quite common, uh, people, it's easier to eat, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, you have this boy eating what, mosquito coil, okay, and of course, uh, people chewing on bark, chewing on tree branches and so on so this is called pika all right so what exactly causes them to eat this is quite unclear sometimes it's a way of distressing or maybe it's a way of showing that they want attention or maybe they want help they're not able to reach out okay so this has to be tackled with uh sort of like psychologically uh, right they know they themselves know it should not be eaten but they still like to do it uh, okay all right so this is the lesson for you today so sorry i've taken more than one hour i did not expect it to be that long but i just want to cover everything i want you to understand 100 percent. okay so i hope to see you in my next lesson so um thank you very much you can you can um share the link to other people who may need to learn okay i've got some questions here you mean alcohol is acidic oh no 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 not alcohol is acidic huh? alcohol is not acidic it's just that alcohol will what do we say about that huh? uh alcohol is not acidic alcohol is not acidic it is actually uh it will cause maybe your stomach uh i don't know how it causes your stomach your gastritis but it's known to maybe the lining all right when your alcohol is inside your stomach it will uh you don't have food inside your stomach so it will somehow i do not know the the, the explanation how it goes up but uh, it is not good for your stomach to drink wine or beer on an empty stomach. Okay, it will cause the lining to to the protection will not be that will not be that will not be that. Okay, paper too hungry yeah. Uh, uh, that one can't be helped because it's like maybe maybe in terms of needs uh, uh you can't find food. That one can be what lah. But these are people who can know that they they know that there is food and they still want to eat it. Uh, okay all right so maybe uh i try to find out what, how alcohol can uh what they call that make your this one stress up huh? uh, how does alcohol uh cause gastritis okay maybe you can pm me and i'll try to answer you okay uh jia, jia, what's your name sorry i can't do that <laughs> jia, jia peng, uh. okay uh so jia tong, right, jia tong. so maybe okay i will see you next time okay bye bye everyone Thank you. See you again.